Welcome. Um, this is Valentine's Day, and we won't do our usual ritual, which is to make you kiss the person next to you. <laughs> Might be misunderstood, so not everybody's from the journalism school here. Uh, listen, thank you very much for coming. It's a great uh, pleasure. I'm Ed Wasserman, the dean of the Graduate School of Journalism. Um, this is the first of three special events featuring leading journalists who cover Israel. And let me just plug the other ones. On the 21st of February, Aluf Ben, who's the editor-in-chief of Haaretz, uh, Israel's oldest daily newspaper, will be here. And on the 7th of March, Janine Zakaria, uh, who's a former Jerusalem bureau chief of the Washington Post, former Washington bureau chief of the Jerusalem Post, and now is the uh, visiting lecturer at Stanford University, will be here. I want to thank the Israel Institute and its executive director, Ariel Roth, and program director, Michael Koplow, for sponsoring our guest of honors trip here. And I want to also thank Ken Bamberger, faculty director of the Berkeley Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies, and Joan Beter, who I'll introduce in full in a few minutes, the Associate Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism. Um, Again, thanks for coming. I have to say a few, just a few introductory remarks. I am of the Exodus generation, um, not the second book of Moses, uh, but Leon Uris, Otto Preminger, Paul Newman, Eva Marie Saint, Sal Mineo, you forgot <laughs> Sal Mineo, Ernest Gold's music, the proud, the defiant statement of a young country, um, untroubled by uh, moral ambiguities, untroubled by any lack of clarity in its own history, sure of its purpose and its rectitude. Uh, that uh, worldview, in my experience, has hardened and calcified into the dominant worldview of Jews in this country, quite unlike, uh, as is often observed, the robust and rich political discourse in Israel. And that's why it is such a pleasure to introduce our guests to inaugurate this speaker series because he is one of those voices that has kept Israeli discourse as interesting and as vibrant and as vital uh, as it has been and as is Jewish discourse in this country often fails to be, in my opinion. Ari Shavit, one of Israel's foremost journalists and columnists, born in Rehovot, Israel. He served as a paratrooper in the IDF, studied philosophy at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, in the 1980s, he wrote for the progressive weekly Kodaret Rashid. In the early 19, this would be the early 2000s, I think. He was chairperson of the Association for Civil Rights in Israel. In 1995, he joined Haaretz, Israel's oldest paper, dating from 1919, the creation of Zionist socialists like much of Israel. Uh, Ari is a senior correspondent, a member of the Haaretz editorial board and is also a commentator on Israeli public television. In recent years, his voice has become one of the most powerful and influential voices in Israel's public arena. His unique writings, which challenge the dogmas of both right and left, have made him one of the leading political and social thinkers of the Jewish state. He'll be in conversation with our own Joan Beter. Joan's background, she worked as a producer for ABC Network News for a decade, then spent a decade teaching at Columbia Journalism School coming to Berkeley in 1990. Among her own research, she spent 10 summers in Singapore and wrote a history of the Jews of Singapore. Here she teaches TV news reporting, also taught a cross-platform course reporting on Palestine and Israel, and is the associate dean of the school. I'm honored and delighted to introduce both of them to you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you give me a word? Uh -huh. Please, there are yes, places here. The there is no, no reason to stand there. There are at least six, seven, eight seats here. Seats in the front row. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, okay, thanks, Ed, for um, that nice introduction and also for hosting, uh, for providing a venue for this event. Um, it's really very much appreciated. I just want to thank Rebecca Goldberg and her team at the Institute of Jewish Law and Israeli Studies, and Julie Hirano, who's uh, at the Journalism School, both of whom, all of whom worked really to get this event 
and the food for you all going. Um, okay, uh, welcome Ari Shavit. I'm very pleased to have you here. Love, well, I won't say what I put on the book, that's not right, but I just did want to congratulate you on the National Jewish Book Award for History. Thank you. Um, so to give Ari a little sense of what the audience, um, back the knowledge of this audience, how many of you have read the book? Ooh, wow. How many have read reviews of the book as well as, <laughs> whoa. How many read the New Yorker Magazine piece uh, on lead-in? Ah, interesting. So now you know who you're speaking to, to whom you are speaking. Um, I just want to tell you a couple of phrases that came out when I talked to friends about uh, what they thought of you or the book. And so these are just a few. Some of these people are in this room. Uh, someone said, which is true, a very personal primer on the history of the Jewish state. Someone else said a very disturbing work. Uh, someone else about you said, he's my hero for telling the truth and being honest. And somebody else said, he's uh, a very tortured man. <laughs> so, so now my question is, I'm do, sure somebody... Do I, do I look like a tortured man? You look happy to me, but some, some of these I'm sure resonate with you, but it leads me to ask you, why did you write the book and what was your goal? What was your purpose? <clears throat> uh, you know, when I, when I set out on this mission some years ago, uh, people said, don't do it. Mm. First of all, they said no one would read an Israel book. Uh, and then they said, you know, there are so many Israel books, why need another one? And I had two answers. One was my own personal need. Existential need in a kind of personal philosophic way, not in the strategic Iranian way. Uh, <laughs> Since I was born, since I remember myself, I was aware of the fact that I was born to unique, in a unique country, in a unique nation, to a unique historical event. And I always had the need to decipher it to myself, what's going on. And, and in some ways, I had this need you know, of a villager to go climb up the hill and look at his own village. Hmm and see what is it all about, what's the context, what's happening. So that was the personal thing, and, and I always wanted it to, to do it, and when the opportunity came, I went to do it. But there was, when, I, when I looked at it, and I looked at all these other books, and there are so many great Israel books, mm. I realized that there isn't a deep, personal, non fiction book that deals with the entire Israeli experience. Mm. That such a book has not been written for a long time. And it occurred to me that this is no coincidence. That the reason that there isn't such a book is that we in Israel have lost our narrative. Mm -hmm. Now in my mind, any nation needs a narrative. Definitely immigrant nations. You have a very strong narrative mm -hmm. about yourself here although you're quite big, quite secured, and getting, getting on in years. <laughs> we are young, endangered, fragile, and the sad thing about Israel, that to begin with, we had such a strong narrative. Mm. Judaism, to begin with, comes from the book. Mm -hmm. Zionism came from a story, from a strong sense of story, what we are about, where, are, where we have come from, and where do we want to go. And the irony is that as Israel became stronger, economically, militarily, politically, the narrative, the narrative that is so essential, evaporated, it disintegrated. In my mind, the narrative disintegrated, one, because of 1967, because of occupation, and the debate over the territories and occupation, which split our old narrative. Mm -hmm. My older friend, Chaim Guri, the poet, used to, he says that our old ethos was the besieged and the just. Mm. That's the exodus ethos. And that disintegrated from 67 on, right. and every year it got worse. But there was another element that after 73, 1973 in many ways was Israel's first world war. Mm. The terrible bloodshed created the the collapse of the ancien regime of Israel, just like the monarchies That's and the old order of Europe. Mm -hmm. 
and the old sense of meaning, what was religion and, and tradition in Europe was our old labor Zionist ethos and leadership. All that collapsed. And we moved from being an over-mobilized society to an over-critical society. Mm. Many people think that the trouble with Israel is extremism. And I think we have a serious extremism problem. But the other trouble with Israel is cynicism. Mm. We've become too cynical. The acid of cynicism is killing us from within. Mm. And I think that the combination of the debate, the split society over the political issue with cynicism made us unable to see what an amazing, amazing story the Israel story is. Mm. You like it, you don't like it, you are bitter, you are pessimistic, you are hopeful. This is an amazing human endeavor. This is an amazing human phenomenon. Mm. So what I try to do in my book is to write a book that deals with the history, but is not a history book, that is relevant to politics, but it's not a political book. I wanted to bring back the human story. Mm -hmm. So by telling human personal life stories, and by dealing it personally with all my heart out there, mm. with all my passion, with all my torment, all my joy, all my passion, I tried to let people, first of all in Israel, but outside of Israel, mm. have a look at the grand thing, at the big picture, and at the human drama Israel mm -hmm. is. And this is what I wrote the book. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, I'm taken by your uh, comment about cynicism because I'm thinking uh, the book, because I want to go back when cynicism was not in the picture and start from the beginning. The book proceeds, as many of you know, chronologically, but each chapter is chronological by an event that happened in that period of time. Um, so he's, he, uh, Ari chooses a defining event and makes that the centerpiece of the time in that chapter. And I want to go back to the ideological times, which is the very first chapter, which is um, called um, At First Sight, 1897. 1897. It's the story, his personal story. And I think that's a good place to begin. And then we will proceed chronologically through the book and choose certain elements that uh, are relevant and I think will resonate with the audience. So tell us a little bit about your first chapter. Look, the, in the preface, the beginning, the, the, when I went on this journey, mm -hmm. I asked myself three questions, which in my mind are the, the relevant and real Israel questions. Why Israel? What's Israel? And will Israel? And in many ways, the first chapter is why Israel? Because I asked myself, my great-grandfather, Herbert Bentwich was a very unusual Jew for that time. In many ways, he was 100 years ahead of his time because he, his life in London, in St. John's Wood, London, of 1890s, was very much like the life of many successful American Jews in this country. He made it. He was a self-made man. He made it. He made a fortune being a copyrights lawyer. He was... As, except for the fact that he was Jewish, he was as British as you can be. Mm -hmm. He was a real Victorian gentleman. He loved the Queen, he mm -hmm. loved the Empire, he loved Shakespeare, he loved the theater, mm -hmm. he loved the Lake District. He was fully within the center of British life and he had it all going for him. So I asked why would such a person travel from the central of the world's capital to the remote, desolate wasteland Palestine was. And basically, I come up with two answers. One is that he and the other founding fathers and mothers of Zionism had the brilliant insight of seeing ahead of time that Europe was becoming a death trap to its Jews. Mm. In many ways, they tried to preempt in the 1890s, the 1940s. Mm. They did not know there will be a Holocaust. They did not know there would be gas chambers. But they realized that new Europe, modern Europe, 
is developing a new kind of anti-Semitism based on race that is more dangerous than the old anti-Semitism based on religion. Mm. And they faced with the radical challenge of how literally to save the Jews physically and how literally to save the Jewish people, mainly the Jews of Eastern Europe. Mm. They went for a radical solution. And in this sense, they created the most dramatic and successful revolution of the 20th century. Mm. Because they transferred the people from one continent to another. They took a land, they created a nation, they revived the language, and all that in order to create a home for a homeless people. So that was the one insight. Mm. The other insight is so relevant to the American Jewish community today. Because in many ways, what they did in the 1890s is try to preempt the Pew Report of 2013 and the challenge facing the American Jewish community today. Because they realized that when the pogroms will be over and anti-Semitism will not be brutal and Jews will enjoy liberty and success and will be fully emancipated, non-ultra-Orthodox Jewish civilization will be in jeopardy. And if there will not be a national home created for the Jewish people that will be a powerhouse for non-ultra-Orthodox Jewish identity, we might evaporate. We will not go up in smoke physically, but we'll just evaporate. Because of, so, because of assimilation? Is absolutely. That, mm -hmm. They saw, again, what is, the, what is on the mind of every Jewish parent in this country that cares about his identity and wonders where his children are and where his grandchildren would be. This is what the early Zionists saw over 100 years ago. Mm. And this is what's so striking about their project, that on the one hand, it was an attempt to save the physical life of the people of Eastern Europe, but on the other hand, it was an attempt to deal with the challenge facing us all in the prosperous, generous, liberal, democratic West of today. So my chapter there gives the two justifications, great justification of why Israel, why Israel is just, as Israel is needed, why Zionism was an extraordinary movement that should not get the kind of bad reputation it gets these days. <laughs> but then I deal with the flaw. If these were the seeds of the victory, of the triumph, I see the seed of the tragedy. And the mm. tragedy is that when my great-grandfather goes and travels through this land, he doesn't see the other. He doesn't see the half a million Arabs already living there. He doesn't see that Jaffa is a predominantly Arab city, an Arab Ramle, an Arab leader, and the Palestinian villages on the way to Jerusalem. Mm. And his blindness, his blindness, and blindness is a theme throughout the book. It begins, but it's the source of the tragedy. And the tragedy is the conflict. You wonder, you wonder. This is a hundred year war. All the attempts to end it so far have failed. Ireland is dealt with. Yugoslavia is dealt with. India and Pakistan, somehow okay. And this conflict is a persistent, bitter, deep conflict that basically is not, as I sometimes say, about occupation, although I'm totally against occupation. But it's not about occupation, and it's not about settlements, but it's about our failure to see the Palestinian people, and it's about the Palestinians' failure to see us, the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. We did not see they are there, and they to this day, I regret to say, refuse to see that the, we are a real people, that has legitimate rights, mm -hmm. and that has a right to have a state of its own in the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. And this is what the conflict about, and it all begins with the very arrival of the first Zionists, such as my great-grandfather mm -hmm. mm -hmm. in the port of Jaffa. Right. I, um, we'll get to talk about blindness um, later because, as um, Ari says, that is a, a definite theme in his work. And also another theme is very often something that starts out in an idealized way does end up in a tragic way. It's not just this, it's uh, many other things, occupation, um, uh, the settlers, and so that's another thing, that things that start out with high hopes end up 
in a way destroying them, their own visions. That's a very um, nuanced but constant theme in his book. So I'm going to whip through a couple of um, chapters here. Chapter two is called Into the Valley, and it's the era of 1921. It deals with the Valley of Harod, uh, an early kibbutz called Ein Harod. If I say anything wrong, please correct. Ein Harod. Thank yep. you. Bob Walter is here to help out on the pronunciation. Thank you very much. Um, and um, it's, um, it exemplifies the beginning of the, the Zionist adventure. Uh, the next chapter is called Orange Grove, 1936, and it deals with your hometown, pretty much, of Rehovot, before you, well before you were born. And we learn a lot about the orange groves that grew there, the success of the businesses, the um, Zionists who were, were the farmers, and the Arabs who picked the, the juicy oranges for them. But always there's an undercurrent of um, knowing that there's something unsettling. There have, been, there have been violence with the Arabs. And so as, even though there was tremendous success, there was this under, in fact, I just said to Ari earlier, I was waiting for a battle to break out. It's a very tense chapter. And it's like you think of the next page, there's going to be a violence. But it doesn't quite come until later. And the reason I'm whipping through these two is because I want to get to um, chapter four, which is titled Masada. Um, Masada? Mas um, depending on which country you're in. And um, I, I think that chapter is really a key chapter. We meet a very important um, central character called Shivarya. I said it wrong. No, no, that's okay. And Gutman, Gutman, and I want you to talk about him and as a, a fascinating figure and really key in many ways to the rest of the book. If, if, uh, if, I'm, if, if you'll allow me, I'll, I'll begin with the orange book, actually, Fine. and then get, get to him. Your book. <sighs> <laughs> Look. Again, and I'll, I'll connect it a bit to, 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 to the present discourse. You know, many, many people today see Israel as some sort of extremist, nationalist, religious entity. My claim that Israel is not that yet. It might become that, but it's not that yet. And my claim is what Israel really wants to be is California. Mm -hmm. The, the problem we have in our present is that our California is surrounded by Hayatollahs. Hmm. We don't have Oregon to our north. <laughs> we have Syria collapsing in terrible bloodshed hmm. that the world cannot deal with. We don't have a friendly Mexico to our south. We have a Hamas-controlled Gaza, which is a major rocket base. And the drama of Israel is the tension between our wish, our deep wish, to be California and the reality we find ourselves in. So for a while, and this is why the orange robe is so important, we were going to be California. The orange robe is an important chapter because in many ways, the orange groves that produced the amazing, beautiful Jaffa oranges were Israel's first startups. Mm. They were so sophisticated. The know-how, the ingenuity that went into it, the combination of knowledge, scientific knowledge brought from California to Palestine that produced, the combined with the land, with the energy, the commitment to work hard, Actually, tiny Palestine intimidate the California orange growers in 1930s. We were a power of orange growing when we were so tiny. Hmm. So that was the miraculous spirit of Israel before it was Israel, expressed in these amazing orange groves that also happened to be so beautiful, a bit more than startup companies. But even today, we have this California similarity. You have your Silicon Valley nearby, and we have our startup nation. You have your beach boys and beach girls, and we have our beach boys <laughs> and beach girls. We are very Californian in many ways. But the conflict, the conflict won't let us have what you have and what we want. And this is the inherent tension about Israel, the gap between our basic values and our California dream and 
this terrible conflict and this terrible, brutal region which we, with which we have to deal with all the time. And that's where Masada comes into it. Mm -hmm. Because up to 1936, and this is why you're asking, I think, a very important question. Mm -hmm. In my mind, everything that is happening in that land is footnotes to 1936. Because up to March 1936, Zionism was a utopian movement. We were really totally moral, totally just. In 1936, if we had our way, we would have saved millions who were about to perish in Europe. In 1936, we did not, we did some injustice to Palestinians, but we did not use real brutal force. So in 1936, Zionism is really pure, just, and successful, very successful. But then come the two terrible tragedies. In Europe, the Eastern European Jewish people is massacred. The people that Zionism was supposed to save are gone. While in Palestine begins this terrible clash between what is now the Jewish National Liberation Movement and the Palestinian Liberation Movement. And they both emerge. They, they are born in blood, in violence. They are at each other's throats. So from 36 on, the story of the land becomes a tragic story of brutal conflict. And the man you talk about, Shmarja Gutman, is an amazing figure because he's a, he's a tiny man. He's a very, he's, he, he's a devoted Zionist and a zealot Zionist, but he has all the wisdom of a Jew, you know, he has Jewish wisdom and sophistication. He's a multi-layered person. He's, he, he acts in one way, but he sees his actions from the side. He's, he's, he's an amazing figure. Wow. And Shmaya Gutman invents Metzadah. He invents Metzadah. What I describe in the book is the journey he takes, if I remember correctly, 46 cadets to Metzadah. But he creates what we call today the Metzadah ethos, or complex or whatever. Why? Because after the clash with the Palestinian ends in 39, he and Ben-Gurion and Galili and the other leaders of Zionism realize that we are heading for a cataclysmic war. They don't know yet if the war will be with the German Nazis or with Arabs or with the coalition of the German Nazis with the Arabs. But they know that the dream is gone. That it's not going to be a utopian Ghana. We have to prepare. We, have, we are faced with a choice. Either give up and retreat and say we were wrong, or move on forcefully with brutal force. Mm -hmm. And Shmaria, many things are done. The, 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 Israel has a higher command, Matkal, nine years before there is a state. There is a military industry being built. Everything is prepared for the day of judgment. But the most striking thing is that Shmalia Gutman says, I have to change the minds of the Israeli youngsters, of the suburbs. I have to prepare them for war. I have to make them ready to sacrifice themselves. So he chooses Metzadah as a kind of secular icon, a secular, it's, it's a substitute for, for, for a church or for a temple in many mm. ways. And when he takes these youngsters there and he penetrates the idea of Metzada into the minds of an entire generation, mm. he, sees, he sees the future. He knows there is a terrible war coming. And six years before the war actually erupts, he changes the mind of a generation, and he's successful. The 1940s Metzada, the new Metzada, the, the fabrication of this ethos and the, the, the act of, of building a nation's mind, not rebuilding a nation's psyche around Metzada, that changed history in the most remarkable and, and, and 
horrible and 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 I mean it's it's so tragic because it was needed, it was sad, it was brutal, but it was in many ways heroic. And this is what, what Metzada is about. It's this the change from the Orange Grove Zionism to Metzada Zionism is the most dramatic transformation and tragic transformation that we went through. So the young generation that he was training, that was the generation that fought in the War of Independence. These were the mindset, because we're moving now into the critical, most dramatic to many people uh, chapter, which is the one about Lida, and the, it's called um, Lida 1948. So I see a relationship between the people he was training and the soldiers who fought that uh, war. Uh, and Gutman himself was a commander. Absolutely. At the, so this Absolutely. is a story that many of you, I'm sure, have thought a lot about. And I'd like you to put it in context. It's a Absolutely. Hard By chapter. the way, there is one person who was on that uh, journey of his, of the 46, who was not an active soldier in the 48 war, but he was very important to Israel's defense. And he happens to be Israel's president right now. Oh. His name is Shimon sure Peres. Uh, but, but yeah, the, what's good, in many ways, Gutman shapes the Rabin generation. Mm -hmm. Rabin specifically was not on that track, but the, the Rabin generation is shaped by Gutman's Masada. This is what prepares them mentally for the 48. And then, as, as you refer to, this leads to this terrible, terrible cataclysmic event of 48. And the very same Gutman finds himself the commander, the military uh, uh, um, uh, commander of Lida after it is uh, conquered in July 1948. And, you know, there's been so much talk about this chapter of mine. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I say, you know, two things about it. I feel that it was more moral duty to address this dark side of our history that so many people try not to see. Yes, Talking of blindness. Yes. I think blindness led us to Lida and we kept <coughs> blind about Lida because it was so convenient. Because Lida is where that clash between our values and the brutal reality came to its height. That's the peak of the drama of that clash. So what I say is, on the one hand, it was my commitment, my moral duty to write about it. But on the other hand, I think it's the moral commitment, duty of our neighboring Palestinians to get over it, to try to move. I, we have to understand their tragedy, their pain, their formative trauma of 48. They have to try to move forward and not to be addicted to it. Because, to put Lida in context, one, you know, in the victimhood game, no one can, if there's a victimhood competition, no one can beat the Jews. <laughs> no one can beat the Jews. So it's not recommended to anyone to try that. But I think there is, there is in Israel, you actually see an example of people who experience such tragedy, such horror, they did move forward in their own way. Mm, and that was true. the impressive aspect of Zionism. Mm. And I wish the Palestinians, in this sense, will have their own Zionist spirit of remembering their past, feeling for it. I don't expect them to forget it or to ignore it, but not to be addicted to it. And it's important to me because there were some attempts to use this leader in order to, 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 to attack Israel's legitimacy. Mm. And, and I've you know, two or three things to say about it. The first one is that Dresden, just a few years before, was a hundred years, hundred times worse than Lida. Mm. And no one, no one claims that the United Kingdom is not legitimate because of Dresden. So when people try to claim that Israel is not legitimate because of Lida and such events, I beg to differ. But the other point that has to be remembered is the context of that war. That was a cruel, vicious civil war. You had a civil war in your history. Mm. You know what it's like. And wherever the ar ar armies won in that war, not one Jew remained at home. 
And in most places, there were atrocities. So the reason there is a leader chapter, and not a Nesiona chapter, or a Rishion Lezion chapter, or a Chovo chapter, is just the fact that we happened to win. The Palestinians were not some righteous victims. There was a brutal war, and there is no doubt that had they won, we would not have stayed in the land, mm. and there is good reason to think that had they won, most of us would have been slaughtered. So on the one hand, I think that it's my duty, because this is my moral responsibility, to look at Lida as it is with all its words. It's a horrible thing. Mm. But on the other hand, I encourage all others to see it within context and not to, to, to abuse and manipulate this tragic and traumatic event. Mm -hmm. So the facts were all available. The facts that you report in, in great detail in this chapter were available to be written about, but it's never been written about like this. Look, the facts, you know, definitely, you know, Benny Morris and others have, yeah. have told the story yes. in, 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 in his story. I think the, diff, the great difference is I was privileged in, in one way because I was, in, I was fascinated by Lida many years ago. So I interviewed Shmaya Gutman and the commander of the brigade, my, whose name I don't mention, although it's obvious who he is, and probably a dozen or seven, ten, or up to a dozen of the, of the warriors who participate ah. in the battle. So I had the combination of, of, of data, of, of interviews, with, with people who were actually there that told me the real story, not just in a kind ah. of military history documents, you know, the, the brigade came for that from the north, the, the armored vehicles from, right, from right. the east. I had the real human, human story. story. That, mm. And I tell it as a human story. So I think that what, what makes... I have no, there are no historical revelations there about Lida, but I think, you know, it's one thing, there are different ways of knowing. And I think what I do throughout in the book is to let people know what was historically known, but to feel it and, mm -hmm. and in, in an intimate and emotional and human way. And I think this is the shock that people experience because, yeah. you know, the, the, the facts were out there, but the way I tell it forces people to see it as, a, as the terrible human, human uh, event that, that it was. Right. Okay, great. Now, I, um, the next chapter is called The Housing Estate, 1957. And um, this is, uh, you were born in 1956. My first trip to Israel was in 1958, actually. Uh, 10th year anniversary. Not that and you didn't come visit? I didn't see a housing estate. That's what I was really upset about when I read the book. I don't, they didn't take us there. We were still idealized, singing, dancing, you know, the whole... But um, the reason I bring this up is because um, you were a child, and yet when you went back to do a chapter as a grown-up on the um, era of the late 50s, early 60s, um, you chose to do it um, about the housing estate. And I wanted to read a quote from your book, which simply says, when I choose the place that most evokes the Israel of 1957, it's not Rehoboth, it's not a kibbutz or a moshav, not Jerusalem, Haifa, or Tel Aviv. I choose a housing estate of Bitsaron. So I'd like to know why, or for you to tell us why, and um, how, why the housing estates most characterize Israel in the 50s. Look, uh, people ask me, what, what have I learned that I didn't know during this journey? I think that the most important thing I learned is how amazing amazing 1950 Israel was. Mm. And my claim is the following. You know, Israel is generally known for its military heroism. A group people call it militarism, mm. brutality, or heroism. Mm -hmm. But it's that side, the Ali ben Kanan part. There were many other nations that have displayed military heroism that is as, as striking as ours. The Russians in World War II, many Americans, others, were as, as heroic as, as Israeli wars were. I admire our pioneers. I think there was something unique about them. But you had pioneers in this country as well. 
What's really unbelievable about Israel is the civilian heroism of the 1950s. Imagine America. Imagine America today going through a war in which three and a half million Americans are killed. Mm. And then imagine America in the three and a half years following that traumatic war absorbing 500 million immigrants. Can you imagine that? Is that humanly possible? Israel did that. Israel did what no other nation did. It, we just came out of a terrible war. We were surrounded by strong Arab nations, not like now, that wanted to destroy us. We were totally isolated in the world. And yet, in these incredible, impossible conditions, we absorbed more immigrants a population of 650,000 Israelis absorbed a million, over a million immigrants within a few years. So first of all, when you, when you look, I mean, the gap, the gap, you know, you look at our history and say, you know, Abba Ivan was our foreign minister, now Avigdor Lieberman is our foreign minister. <laughs> and, but you look at the leadership that we had then, the leadership that we had, that took all the right decisions, in, first of all, providing food and building villages. Then providing how we have this terrible, Israel is so rich now, and it cannot deal with its housing problem. It cannot build several hundred thousand apartments to give housing to young people. But Israel, that was a midget, that was nothing, built 200,000 apartments, housing state apartments in the 1950s. So they were small, they were ugly, they were, but the people in 1951, a third of the population lived in tents. Mm. And within a few years, we solved that. And then we moved on to industrial. We went through a kind of in industrial revolution of our own in the mid-50s. So Israel of the 1950s is the most remarkable, remarkable state you can imagine. But within that, you have to look at the details. Who are the people who came to Israel? They were either refugees from the Arab world we had to leave their home and their civilization within months or weeks and lose everything and come to these terrible refugee camps in Israel where they were treated badly. Or they were human wrecks, mm. the survivors of Holocaust who had nightmares at night and numbers tattooed into their arms. And this is what you see in this shikun, in this housing estate. You see this remarkable Fellini-like existence, yeah. a kind of petite bourgeois heroism of people who have come from death, who are faced with incredible challenges, but they are, do not become bitter or angry or extremely nationalistic. They don't go for suicide bombing. Mm. They choose life. Mm. And they send their children to schools, and they build a health system better than yours, <laughs> and they built a social system and housing, they move on with life. So this incredible spirit of Israel of the 1950s is something that makes me so proud of being an Israeli. Mm. And when I look at our leadership and our policies today, I'm ashamed of it. Mm. I'm ashamed of it. Because this people that has it within it to do this Heroic heroism of the 1950s is acting now in such a appalling and stupid and, 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 and unrespectable manner. Mm. So my hope, my political hope, is that we will go back to that spirit, not in the same way we cannot go back to that old socialism and that kind of ethos. But we, I do think that we have it in us, this incredible Israeli spirit that did the, this, created this man-made miracle, Israel is in the 1950s, I think if we go back to that kind of ethos and that kind of spirit, we can turn Israel to a worthy and remarkable place. Wow, that's quite a challenge. It is. Um, and but the challenges there were so harder. Greater, if yeah. we did that, we can do this. Yeah.
Well, but I'm wondering if it's really possible, and this going back to your, um, to your theme of blindness, uh, because, and I want you to talk a little bit about that blindness, because obviously that's part of what the problem is even today. Um, but you talk about the Israeli blindness from your grandfather's day, through the Orange Grove people, through the um, leadership, all the way down to Iran today. So uh, talk a little bit more about this blindness. I'm even wondering if you can possibly live in Israel without the blindness, and maybe it's, um, maybe it's a good thing or a desirable thing, not good. But so would you just, just talk a little bit about this idea of blindness that per really pervades the whole book? Yes, it, it's, it it's definitely, you know, as someone tell me, it's a bit like an optometrist book, you know, what you see <laughs> and what you, you don't see, what you don't, what see. You don't see. Right. Oh, there, there are several things to say about it. One is that, ironically, it's usually the people on the extremes who could see, while the people mm. in the center who were blind and active. People on the left had no problem seeing the Palestinians and seeing the tragedy because they thought we can make peace and solve it all. That's where, like, my great uncle, who was the son of that first British lawyer who came, who was one of the leaders of the first peace movement, Brit Shalom. Mm. His people like him, you know, they saw the problem, they saw the Palestinians, and they said, we can solve it easily. The people on the right, like Jabotinsky and people right of him, had no problem seeing the problem because they realized that history is about brutal force and they said it's going to be a war, we'll take the country by the sword and we'll win, we'll be the, build an iron uh, uh, curtain. And the people in the white center, they were the ones with the conflict because they had what we call now liberal values, perhaps they were socialist values in the past, that were in total con contrast to the reality of the conflict. Mm. And therefore, they needed blindness. So in this sense, you are right that in a sense, there was a kind of, from their point of view, a kind of constructive blindness. Had they seen where it was going? You know, if some of, when I try to think of some of my great uncles, great aunts, if they'd known in the 1920s, 1930s, where this is leading to, they wouldn't have been able to act and to stay. They needed the kibbutz dream, and they needed the moral fantasy. Had they known that it's going to be so brutal, they, they would not have had the energy to, to act. So blindness, to a degree, was, in a sense, constructive. And yet, I think it's our role to end blindness. I, I cannot accept blindness as, 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 as an ongoing state of mind. And, and I do think that one of the things I try to do in the book is, is to look at things, even to see things that it's difficult for me to see. I think, it's, again, it's my moral duty. And, and I hope that if we do that, if we open our eyes, but again, not with an extremist way, not in a, in a violent, aggressive way, but we... Look, there is... I'm on the one hand like a realist. Some people think I'm like a realist centrist. And, you know, and I, 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 I'm very much aware of strategic problems, security problems, and so on. But there is, there is a naive person in me as well, and I'm proud of it. I, I really believe in the human spirit, and I believe in human dialogue. And I believe that if we open our eyes, and if our neighboring Palestinians and other Arabs will open their eyes to see our story and our narrative, then I think we can move on. I don't think that the conflict will be over. Mm. I don't think that we'll have peace within a day. But I think that if, say, the present political process will have another dimension of an Israeli leader going to Ramallah and giving a real, real deep kind of Martin Luther King speech, saying to the Palestinians, we recognize what you went through. We know what your painful past is like. But we ask you, for the sake of your children and our children, let's move on together. Let's deal, repair whatever can be repaired, bring as much justice as can be brought, but let's build a new future for the two people. Mm -hmm. I think that a kind of approach like that, a kind of attempt to create an emotional breakthrough, 
Again, I'm not naive. It will not end everything. The conflict will not go away. But it might create a new state of mind that will make all the different attempts to bring about peace not mechanical, legal, right. dipl professional, diplomatic, but will make it a real Hartley experience of real people reaching out real to people. other real people trying to end the terrible tragedy that we are all caught in. Hmm. I think you have to call John Kerry up on this issue. <laughs> If he, that would be probably I, 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 I believe he's, uh, he has page. interest in the book and, uh, and he's reading it. So. Good, good, good to hear. Um, um, one of this, the two great strengths that I want to talk about of the book, one is central characters, and the other, central characters and the other is context. I did think to myself and I said to Ari, if, if, if you have a glass of wine and you take a sip after each time you meet a central character in this book, you'll be drunk about halfway through the book. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of people that you meet, not only in their present state, but their whole background is there. It's really, that's one, one thing that makes it a very, very fascinating and understandable. I mean, you just understand so much more about Israel. One character that I really felt strongly about was a, a Palestinian named Jamar Munher. Um, an older man, who you actually interviewed in 1993, but I'm sure you updated the writing about it. So could you, speaking about people to people, could you tell us about that character and how he fits into the book? And it's, it's, it's almost really a tone poem. It's so beautifully written, in, in my view. Thank Small you. part of the chapter. Thank Beautiful. you. Really um, in, in 1993, 1992, 1993, I... I, I had a, another project that never actually became a book of, of talking to Palestinians, mainly Palestinian refugees. Uh, and one of the most striking men, older men that I met, he's no, no longer alive, was Jamal Munhir, who, whom I took back to his home village uh, of Hulda. Now, Hulda is usually known in Israel as Amos Oz's kibbutz. Mm. People who know a bit more about the history realize that it's one of really the most endearing kibbutzim, that really of the very moderate, utopian kind. It, Hulda, the kibbutz Hulda was in the past really the best of Zionism in many mm. ways. Uh, and yet, in 48, with the tragedy happening against things were the Palestinians were not uh, uh, Mother Teresa's either. You know, they, they, they were the first actually to attack a convoy near Hulda and actually to slaughter it. Mm. it and then Ben-Gurion takes the decision that changes the war and begins the great offensive that started to conquer and destroy Arab villages. And it begins in Hulda. Mm. Mm. So I go with Jamal Munhir to his old village, that is. And he tells me the story of the remarkable relationship between his village and the old kibbutzniks of Hulda. Mm -hmm. How in the beginning the kibbutzniks looked so strange and weird, and the girls with their short pants, and, and no, one owes, and no one owns anything, and all this, they call them Moscovites, the Russians. Mm -hmm and how he gradually learned to like them and respect them because they were working so hard and they were actually producing that so much came out of the land that did not exist before. So they had a kind of farmer's respect for them. But then from his point of view, in 1948, out of this neighboring kibbutz comes this enormous military force, conquers his village, destroys its village, and he becomes refugee. And he, who was a wealthy man within his context, has nothing. And he has no respect and no life. And we walk around, first of all, the ruins of the village. Now almost all the, all the ruins are gone. At mm -hmm. that time, you could still see this. Building. And then we go, it says, I'll show you my piece of land. And it so happens that his piece of land is right next to Bet Herzl, to the Herzl house, mm. that is in the middle of the Herzl forest, that is like the symbol of beautiful Zionism. 
So you see the entire tragedy. Because really, I mean, the, the people of Hulda were no, not evil. I have no, I don't think they did. But, but he's such a victim. And, and what I say there is that anyone, this is, this, I end my peace chapter with that. I mean, anyone who thinks that the conflict is about 67 and about Ofoa, which I, it's another chapter that I have, is mistaken. Because, and, and, and I think we have to enter occupation and to deal with the settlements, but the conflict is about Hulda, it's not about Ofoa. And, 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 and this is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. so, so I sit there with him. You know, there, there is, what I do for this chapter, I go back to the place and I recall my, 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 my meeting with him and my visit. Right, and beautiful. now, by the way, there is a beautiful, or, uh, not orange, a wine grove there, because now yeah. Israel is into yeah. fine wines. Mm. So, and you look at, these, at this wine grove, and, and really this is Zionism at its best, Israel at its best, and the tragedy at its worst. What's the good news? Where's the good news? So first of all, I said some of it when I talked about the 50s. Yeah. Now, I think this amazing strength within the Israeli society is, is not gone. As I said, I, I'm very critical of our politics. When I look at Israel, that's where I end the book. I see, on the one hand, terrible problem of occupation. I see the problem of intimidation. And the fact that we are the most endangered nation on the face of the earth. And I think this is something that, again, everybody has to remember. When people talk about occupation, always remember intimidation and always deal with both of them, mm -hmm. not with one. They cannot be separated. But after all this, what I see is that while Zionism did not create the utopia it set out to, to build, and while the kibbutz dream, the Hulda dream, is gone, is shattered, and there will not be a socialist paradise there. And there will not be a perfect social justice society. What Zionism did create is the most amazing, the most amazing, robust, free society one can imagine. And when you look at us Israelis, you see that we are innovative and creative and sensual and sexy. And we make more babies than any OECD, <laughs> any other country in the OECD. And that's a very telling figure. Because Israel is full of life. So this people that on the one hand lives on the edge has turned life on the edge to a source of power and energy, mm -hmm. not of despair. And if I have to describe Israel in a sentence, in three words, it's a great phenomenon of vitality against all odds. Mm. And the vitality is unbelievable. The moment you are there, you feel it. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, with all the problems, our lives there, between wars, is great life. The human quality, the human relationships, human intensivity. So we are rude, and we are neurotic, and we are loud, and we are impossible. But we are remarkable, too. So I end this book walking on the, in the port of Tel Aviv, mm. which is a story in itself with its, all its history. Read the book, see mm -hmm. the story. Because you see there, the way it was built in 36 that I referred to, saving Tel Aviv, not by fighting back, but creating a first Hebrew harbor. Again, against all odds, in the wrong place, in a crazy kind of way. But it was created. It was a triumph of the human spirit. And then in the 2000s, when the country was under a terrible terror offensive, it was renovated and it was rebuilt and it became this leisure area. Mm. And when you walk there, you see all this life, this phenomena of life. Mm. In so many ways, the port of Tel Aviv is a kind of central park. Hampstead Heath for me. Mm. And when you look at all the handsome youngsters and the couples, the heterosexual couples and the gay couples, and the people sitting in the cafes and sitting there, sitting, drinking their, their coffees and their Camparis in the morning, and the sky is so blue, mm. and the sea is so beautiful. And you see that after all this tragedy that we went through, 
this terrible Jewish past and this demanding Israeli past, we did create an amazing human phenomenon. So my hope is that the vitality in Israelis, the energy, will be transformed to a political energy that will deal with the conflict and deal with the inherent flaws of Israel. And at the end of the day, this is my hope. My hope is that we are a people that have come from death and are threatened by death, but have chosen life. And we've turned Israel to an amazing celebration of life. Wow. I think that's a hope that everybody, many people in this, uh, I hope everybody in this uh, audience agrees with. So thank you very much, Ari. Appreciate it. We'll take some questions. <laughs> so, so there are many questions, so let's start um, right in the front. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Moses Levitsky, thank you very much for the, for the talk. I, I want to apologize ahead of time. I haven't read your book, but uh, uh, I want to uh, just ask any, a question. Any mistake can be corrected. Uh, so I, I tend to correct that mistake. But uh, you talk about, uh, uh, first of all, the tragedy of some of the things we did, but you also talk about how we had to change at some point, either change or die, and that some of the, out, some of the things we had to do when we change uh, are unavoidable. And is what's unavoidable, even though in an ideal time it's a tragedy, when it's unavoidable, is it still looked at the same way? And I also want to talk about the narrative that you say we have to understand. We have to understand their narrative. And uh, how about the, the difference between uh, hearing what the narrative really is and what we would like to hear? And, I, mm. I, and as, as an example, I want, to, I want to talk about somebody I met with, uh, a fellow who you might know, named Mahmoud Dajani, who run, who's the head of Al Quds. University. And he talked himself about being marginalized because he is willing to have a dialogue and talk about mutual respect. Uh, you know, I, his dialogue is not necessarily what I agree with, but it is a dialogue we can have. And he complained about this whole idea of anti normalization and the fact that, uh, in, and what that's related to is, that, is where there's a narrative of destruction and not liberation. He talked about, you know, two states sitting side by side, but not everybody talks that way. And we also met with some of the students who complained that as a result of anti-normalization, they, they've had some contact with Israeli students. There's a question in there somewhere, Yes, they've had some contact with Israeli students, but, um, the, uh, but not enough. And they say that, they, that a lot could be accomplished by more interchange and more... So, uh, what, so what's the question? the question? So the question is, what do you say about this whole anti-normalization movement, the fact that the, that the narrative that they have may not be necessarily be the one that we want to hear? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, 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 I suggest you read the book. And, and if you wish, perhaps read a bit of my articles and you'll see that there is nothing new in what you say to my writing and my point of view. I'm, I'm cruelly realistic. And I have no illusion about where many of our neighbors are. So first of all, you want my opinion? All this... BDS in all its forms is a despicable movement in my mind. Not only because I'm an Israeli and I believe, as I said, in, in, in my nation. Because I oppose any such attitude. I'm for dialogue. You, can, you, you have to listen to people. You can argue with them. You can fight them politically. But this attitude that you would not speak, you would not listen, you are worried what, what, what's the fear there? That's exactly the fear. There, there is a fear there that if they will listen to the people on their side, they see that they are not demons, but human beings. And, and this is what they are running away from. So I totally oppose that attitude, not only as an Israeli, as, as on, on, in every field I oppose it. I think that there is, you know, my approach to peace is, is not naive in the sense that I think that we should try peace, we should do everything to achieve it. But if it turns out that there is a problem and there, il, there really isn't a partner for peace on the Palestinian side, we should go for what I call plan B. We should try to work out a way to deal with the issue of occupation even if peace is not possible at this point of time. 
And this is why my alternative, I totally support Secretary Kerry's initiative. I, in all my writing, I try to support him. I, I think he's doing something remarkable and benign and courageous. I'm not sure he will succeed. And therefore, I think, and I say it wherever I go, and I say it to every American diplomat I, met, I meet, I really hope and pray that in some State Department basement there is a secret team planning Plan B. Because if this will not work, the ramifications will be disastrous. And therefore, we have to think of how do we proceed if, as you say, there isn't a people or a leadership on the other side willing to accept the two-state solution. And my alternative idea is to try to create a two-state state, to gradually create a situation there that ends occupation gradually and cautiously, even if peace is not possible. So try peace, but not be naive. Be tough in the negotiations. Demand some things. Demand that the Palestinians will recognize our rights, not only our security arrangements. I want the Palestinians to recognize our legitimacy and our rights. I think this is essential. But if this is not possible and if this doesn't happen, we, for our own good, to save ourselves morally, demographically, and politically, we must end occupation. So we must find the right realistic way of doing this if peace is not possible at this point, this point of time. Thank you. Uh, John. If you have to move to plan B, what will it take to neutralize the forces that are opposed to plan B? Which, referring to whom? Well, people who, people who are opposed to withdrawal, people who are opposed to I, ending I, the occupation. I, so they're a very powerful group. So what would you Look, think? part of my optimism, and I hope it's founded, Look, I think that the Israeli majority is not as extreme as some people think. I think that basically what happened in Israel in the last decade or 15 years is that Israeli public opinion moved like that. Our willingness, of the, our, the willingness of the Israeli majority to make concessions in principle has swung dramatically to the left. Mm. And the proof of that is the following fact. If Benjamin Netanyahu, Let's, let me put it, rephrase it. Golda Meir would have fired Benjamin Netanyahu <laughs> from a government. There was no chance that Netanyahu could have served. In the Golda Meir government, Netanyahu would have been considered a Moked member, Moked, extreme leftist. Only 3% of Israelis in the 1970s, the very 60s and early 70s, were willing to accept the ideas that Israel's, the leader of the Israeli right, is, is committed to right now. Never mind what he means, but that's, this shows you how we swung to the left. I want to remind you what people forget, that Yitzhak Rabin was murdered for peace while opposing a Palestinian state and not willing to divide Jerusalem. Yitzhak Rabin, not the old Yitzhak Rabin of 48 or 67, the new Yitzhak Rabin of Oslo said there will not be a Palestinian state and we will not divide Jerusalem and we will control the entire Jordan Valley. Mm. Benjamin Netanyahu is to the left of Yitzhak Rabin. Wow. And people don't acknowledge that. Why don't they acknowledge it? Because on the other hand, the Israeli public moved to the right. Big. Why? Because four times Israelis opened their hearts to peace. In 1993, we signed the Oslo Agreement, and we brought Yasser Arafat to Gaza. I don't remember the United States making peace with Fidel Castro. And it, it escapes my memory. <laughs> Yasser Arafat, for us, was 100 times more dangerous than Fidel Castro. It's the same type, but like a demonic figure that is, that is challenging something very deep in the political side. Fidel Castro never landed in the West Palm Beach airport. Yasser Arafat went back to Gaza. What happened? Five months later, first bus explodes in Dizikov Street in Tel Aviv. Two years later, after Rabin's assassination, we go out of the cities of the West Bank, Ramallah, Nablus, Jenin. What happens? Two months later, a wave of terror in, in, in central Tel Aviv and central Jerusalem, 60 people get. Four years later, 
we go to Camp David to peace summit. There are all these controversies that Ehud Barak was not polite enough, he was not nice enough. Fact of the matter, he broke every Israeli taboo. He agreed to have a Palestinian state, he agreed to divide Jerusalem, he agreed to give back 100% of the Gaza Strip, and he agreed to give back 90, 95% of the West Bank. What was the result? The worst terror offensive any democracy experienced in recent memory. A thousand Israelis getting killed. My own cafe in Jerusalem being blown at 11.30 p.m. I will not forget the sight of the dead youngsters in the cafe. Five years later, our great nationalist war criminal, Arik Sharon, pulls out of Gaza Strip, destroys the settlements. Not one settlement remains in Gaza, not one checkpoint. What happens? Not a Gaza Singapore, not a Palestinian Singapore, but a Hamas controlled rocket base that, that, that fires rockets out in Israel. So the Israeli center, the Israeli, the middle of the road guy, Gvered Cohen from Chedera and Mr. Levy from Netanya. They opened their hearts four times to peace. And the result was terrible violence. So they are traumatized. And they're not traumatized because they are neurotic Jews. <laughs> they're traumatized because there is a brutal region in a brutal conflict. So if the international community will realize that and will address the real fears, the legitimate fears of the majority of Israelis and will bring about a peace concept that is realistic, that is not forged in Norwegian woods, but is based on the realities of the Middle East, that heard something about what's going on in Syria, and heard something about the great Egyptian democracy, and realized what the Middle East is really like, and what happens to gays in Gaza, and what happens to women in Saudi Arabia. If we will deal with all that and build a peace concept that addresses the Middle East as it is, and the conflict as it is, I'm sure that the majority of Israelis will, will, will come and support it. I'm saying, what I'm saying is that that plan B, that will not promise, because when you come and say to people, tomorrow morning, from where we are, we are going to move. You're going to give back all the territories, and you are going to move to a perfect peace. They don't believe it. They just don't believe it. They think you are not, you know, if you'll say that for their own good, they have to end occupation, and this will be done in a cautious way, in a gradual way, with bringing about all kinds of political enrichment and economic change. I have, I have the full plan. I don't want to bore you with the details. <laughs> I, if the, you will bring a realistic peace concept, I'm sure that you can create, you can build. The, now, you'll still have a problem with the Israeli extremists, with the, but they are a minority. You will have a problem with the Palestinian minority. But I believe that the moderate majority in Israel, the, the, the moderate majority in the West Bank, at least, will work with that kind of concept. And the fact that for 20 years, the international community did not care, did not bother to create this new creative concept is, in my mind, a disgrace. And it's about time. Sorry for the passion. George. Thank you for a book that I found to be beautifully written, uh, emotionally touching, and uh, suspensefully gripping. Thank you. Um, it's. As I read along in the book, I had the feeling that you were uh, very much torn, seeking a way out. But much of that sense of ambiguity and being torn emotionally, it seemed, disappeared in the chapter on Iran. And I wonder if you could speak to the issue of Iran where uh, I just came away thinking, this is a man who is confident of Israel's ability to defend itself unless there's an existential nuclear threat. Do you have right. any? Well, yes, I, I hope that afterwards we'll, we'll move to something more cheerful. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, let me say, I'll, I'll try to be brief. I, I've, uh, unfortunately, I have a, a, you know, a kind of journalist's PhD on Iran. and. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm a, you know, I'm a proud Iran alarmist who uh, sadly has been proven uh, right. 
so I'll, I'll say it in, in, in two paragraphs. Iran is not an Israel issue. Iran, in my mind, is a challenge to our civilization. And it's not because I think that if Iran will go nuclear, it will drop a bomb the next day on Tel Aviv. I do not think it will. But if Iran will go nuclear, within weeks, within weeks, the Saudis will ask their Pakistani friends to dust that bomb on the shelf, and they'll have FedEx getting the, the bomb from Pakistan. So Saudi Arabia will go nuclear within weeks. One or two of the Gulf countries might go nuclear shortly afterwards. Within a year or two, Egypt, Turkey, Algeria will go nuclear. And Israel will have to change its very responsible nuclear policy. So we'll, you will have a multipolar <coughs> nuclear system in the Middle East. We've never tried multipolar nuclear systems in the past. And we will try this in the world's most irrational, violent, unstable region. If this is not hell, I do not know what hell is. And the implication will not be, the, the, again, without any bombs exploding, without any apocalyptic scenarios, the psychological, political, economic impact on Tel Aviv will be disastrous. But within a short time, the psychological, economical, political impact on London, Paris, Toronto, Chicago, and San Francisco will be dramatic. Our lives will change. We are taking for granted the greatest achievement of the international community since World War II, which is the control of the nuclear gene. Mm. And if Iran will go nuclear, it's not about Iran. And all these people are telling, let's end this 35-year conflict. Without. That's ridiculous. Who cares? What's important is the nuclearization of the 21st century. If Iran will go nuclear, that's the end of the greatest success we had as, as, human, as a human community, it's not only the West. So, every, so you, Iran is a, is, a, is a civilization challenge, and Iran is a civilization failure. Because it was so easy for us, us as, as the West, not as Israel. It was so easy to deal with Iran, but we failed to see it. This is really where blindness, blindness. Is, is a strong theme in if we had had a political economical siege in Iran in 2003 or 2005 or 2007 or even 2009, there won't, wouldn't have been a problem. But America chose to go to Iraq and waste all the energy it had in the wrong place. So now the West is a state of fatigue in the post-Iraq trauma, and we are not facing to the real challenge. So this, in my mind, is dramatic. And I can get into the Israeli record of this, where Israel, it, most of the time, Israel was right in what it was saying. But the great mistake was to make it an Israel issue, and even personally, a Benjamin Netanyahu issue. It should not be the case. So I urge anyone, so many people combine their resentment to Netanyahu or their criticism of Israel with the Iran issue. This has, should, should be totally separated. This should not be a bipartisan issue. It should not be a fight between Israelis and Americans, or Americans and Europeans, or Republicans and Democrats. And nuclear Iran will jeopardize the, the, the values of both progressive Americans and conservative Americans and, and South Americans and everybody. So let's open our eyes and let's unite and deal with this in the last moments there are to deal with it. Yes. Uh, why don't you take the option of it, uh, nuclear fuel in the East? You didn't even mention it. Wouldn't it be a good solution to the problem of Iran, nuclear fuel in the East? Can you repeat the question? Um, eventually, yes. Um, You're asking look, the question. Look. The, the, that question was about the nuclear free. I would love a nuclear free Middle East, and I would love a nuclear free world. Uh, why, why, why are you laughing? Why, the, world, the, the Middle East is okay and the world is, is funny. If, if you want to, the way, look at the way the actors in the Middle East act. And tell me if you trust any player in the Middle East to, to be committed to that. To be committed to that. If you can guarantee 
that really there will be, that all the players in the Middle East will respect this. We must see what's going on. I mean, Syria is important not only because of the terrible g catastrophe there, because you see what kind of, of political culture we have. This is what we have. So we have to address the Middle East as it is. It's not Scandinavia. It's not Scandinavia. So if you can guarantee me that all the players in the Middle East will respect the notion of a nuclear-free Middle East, I'm there. I do not think there is a force on this earth that can guarantee that. Yes, in the back. In retrospect, given the history of Europe in the 20th century, in the years before the bomb was invented, there would have been no reason to hope in advance that it would end up having the deterrent effect that it did. I mean, they had a war every generation for 500 years, right? And it, it, they suddenly became quite rational, all those countries in Europe that were, uh, you know, historic. Have, have, have you, I, I suggest the following. I think that when you look at the nuclear uh, responsibility or, or who are you willing to trust with a nuclear power and you're not willing, again, I would love everybody not to have it. But I think that the great test is the attitude to minorities within that society. If you look, if you want to make any comparisons between the, West, the, the way Europe is handling its affairs politically and the way the Middle East is handling its affairs politically, I, I don't see, I mean, after all that we see in the last two years, we'll still be blind to what's going on in the region? This, was, this, is, this is the region that, for, that proves to you daily what, what do we see in the region? We see that this is a region that the problem is not only that the regimes are problematic. There isn't one liberal democratic opposition that can take, except for some good news from Tunisia. But except from that, what do you see in the region? We all believe for a few months that the Google kids are going to bring a new spirit to the Middle East, right? What have we seen, sir? The choice in the Middle East right now is, apart from Israel, is between brutal secular dictatorships and uh, uh, Islamic regimes. This is, this is the choice. So I'm sorry about the, the there are some, uh, uh, not only secular, some, you have some uh, monarchies that are tyrant. Yeah? So you have that option as well. There isn't one democratic, that you see that once power, once tyranny weakens, you have the Syrian bloodshed. This is what you have. So you want to play with nuclear weapons with this region? Yeah, I mean, I mean, enough, enough. I mean, how blind can we be? How blind can we be? There is such a deep problem in the region. I mean, any, anyone can see that. So you want to put nuclear weapons into that? Nobody wants to. This is what you're implying. I'm telling you that if you put nuclear weapons, if, listen, if, I don't know. There, there is this claim. I, I don't know if it's true that uh, some planes bombarded the new, uh, Syrian uh, nuclear facility some years ago. If, if, just imagine, just imagine, just imagine that you would have today nuclear weapons in Syria. You want that? You want your children to experience that? You want your, your grandchildren to live in the world where, 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 where these Al Qaeda forces? And, and, and Alawite butchers have nuclear power? This is what you want? I mean, there's enough, enough with the blindness. I mean, if we talk, like, Israelis were from the same camp, but you're saying I'm different than, than all the rest of you leftists that keep kind of, you know, talking so many bad things about Israel. And I, I could connect to many things that you said uh, and described, and I can connect to what you say about the need for a narrative and a need of, of like, taking going aside and looking at the broader picture. But I do have a problem with the narrative you portray, and I'll try to put it generally, not that it relates to specific things. And that's like, in between the lines, basically you're saying the Israeli story is a story of a unique people 
and not only unique, but a better one. I mean, you're taking the narrative of the chosen people. In a way, that's kind of what came up to my mind, saying, you know, the Israeli story, and you describe it in like a marvelous way, you know, the picture of Tel Aviv and the 50s and everything. It's an enterprise that is different from any story you've heard, and it's like we're, we're, we're magnificent. We did something that nobody else did. That's the, the, the That's idea a fact. of the chosen people. <laughs> no. Okay? Wait, wait. And, okay. and I feel... No. Uh, yeah, but just ask more. a question, okay? Because I... Yeah, one sentence more. This is an idea that could serve a nation in its first year of building, yeah? Of, of building itself. I don't think it serves Israel in a positive way nowadays. What? Saying to ourselves, despite everything that is going on, we're better and we're, we're different. It's not something that is self-serving. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I, I want to be short, and there are so many things to be said. Um, I'll begin with this country. Uh, and, and, and again, you see, I, I think that uh, all the Israeli questions here, in my mind, prove exactly my point about the problem of the ethos of the Israeli elite in the last decades. I think the major problem of Israel is really, I really, I'm an admirer of the Israeli people. I'm a Narodnik in this sense. And I'm very critical of the Israeli elites. And I have issue with all of you Israelis here because I really think that you prove my theory in every question and every sentence you say. Are we, we have lost, we, we have lost the problem. The, first of all, the political, is, pol political, main political problem in Israel is the fact that the left and left of center has failed for decades now in creating a positive ethos that people can relate to. The reason you had Clinton elected in this country and the reason you had Obama elected in this country was that they went beyond the radical critical approach and they afford from the, while keeping their progressive values a wider accepting and loving and patriotic approach this is the only way Democrats won here, and this is the only way, if you want, all the leaders who created, who brought about progressive values. The problem, and it's a deep problem, just proven right now, the deep problem is that the entire political ethos of the Israeli left has become, it, we remained in the 70s. We remained a protest movement. We did not offer the people an overall alternative option. And this is why the people reject us. This is why the left was reduced from 40% to 4%. Because all they hear from their elites is how bad we are, and we should not be proud of ourselves, and you should not be Jewish, and you should not be Zionist, and all that. So they reject that. Because they know there is a very strong, healthy feeling in, among Israelis that, on the one hand, many things are wrong, but there is also something great. Now, where, is this, where did you take these chosen people? I describe you an event, and you give me an event from other, uh, other, our history is a remarkable history, not because we have a great, better DNA. I never said anything like that. I don't think we have the best religion. I don't think we have better, we are like any others. But what we experience in the 20th century, and, and, and the left in Israel doesn't allow to say it. What we experience in the 20th century, no other people has experienced. We lost a third of our people. We, we, are, we are not allowed to, forget, to, we are, to remember that? We are, we, one of the things that is so wrong with the Israeli left-wing elite represented that you just heard this, is the fact that we totally lost, forgot, we, be, we behave as if we are really the British Empire or China. We are not. We are a small, lonely people that most people in the world have ambivalent feelings about. We were murdered. We are the ultimate victims of the 20th century. We should not forget that. And yet we have created an amazing democracy in such a violent region. We should be proud of that. So I'm not saying that we are better. There was no way. I never said it. I will never say it. But when we do a remarkable things, you have to look at the remarkable things. And America, you live now in America. America all the time tells itself how great it is. Democrats say, liberals say, not only conservatives. This notion of the American dream and the American constitution and, and being proud of America is everywhere here. So if the Israeli left, if the Israeli progressive will become blue and white again, 
rather than become post-Zionist and bitter and cynical, if we learn to love ourselves and love our people and appreciate our history and deal with the flaws, deal with the sins in a courageous way, the minds and hearts of Israelis in the middle and even in the right will open to us. Right now, they hear you and people like you, and they say, these people don't like us. And they say, these people don't know what they know of the history. They don't know the, the, the region. They don't realize what it's about. Once we will address them with love, with commitment, with passion, and with realism, we will win, and we will change Israel. I assure you that. Well, okay. well thank you. <laughs> thank you, all. Thank you, everyone. Cool. Well done. Well done. Appreciate that.